So what the hell is GraphQL? Well, it was created by Facebook about six years ago, and it's been in production if you've used um, most of the stuff that Facebook do these days is run with GraphQL. It's definitely production ready, uh, and they needed it to fix one of their problems that they had. Their data in, in Facebook is a graph, so your friends of friends and your likes of likes and things, they, they, it's what they call a big graph, so it's basically lots of connected nodes that all link out. And so that's why they called it GraphQL. It's nothing to do with a graph database. If anyone's heard about those, that's something different. Um, and it's also a, a new API standard. So they liked it that much, and they kept, they, it worked that well. They decided to actually write it up and release it. Uh, so it is a new standard. It's not necessarily a thing in it, of its own. It's more a language. And it ends something that we call reception, or I call reception, which is basically death by rest endpoints. Uh, it makes that go away, uh, which would be great. Might not be needed for everyone. I mean, we're talking about Facebook scale here, which is always one of the problems people have. It's like, well, that's a Facebook scale kind of problem. Do I really need it when I'm making a small website to sell cheese? Uh, but uh, you might. I don't know. Everyone's needs are different. Uh, but it certainly gets around some of the problems that we have with uh, creating millions and millions and millions of, of REST endpoints. And it's a really nice developer experience. Uh, we give it to our front ender, Kyle. Uh, he can do some C sharp, but he can't do a lot of C sharp. Uh, and then we gave him this, and he started playing with it, and suddenly his eyes lit up. He went, oh, I have access to all the data. And he went, there you go. You can, away you go, you're away with it. And so it helps you get that sort of, um, uh, that joyness feeling that you can feel you can be productive. Because a lot, a lot of the Facebook code does that, because their job is to make their developers productive. So they put a lot of time in the tools that they make to help you be productive. So in a nutshell, GraphQL lets you request only the data you need. Again, we've talked about APIs. So request only the data you need, and it will return it in just the shape that you asked for. So this is different to asking for all the data, uh, or asking for um, uh, so overfetching, or having to get loads of fields back that you don't really need, and then throwing loads of them away. Instead, you just say, I just want you know, just these two fields, please, for this particular thing, and it will give you just that. And in a nutshell, that's GraphQL. Um, nice and simple, really. Uh, this was all started by uh, CodeGarden last year. There was a tweet that I put out during one of the talks, um, which was about, uh, I wanted to get GraphQL into Umbraco as, as, as best we could. And last year's CodeGarden was all about headless, um, which is ironic. It's becoming the new V8. It's constantly talked about, but never seems to see, see the light of day. Uh, and uh, when they were talking about headless, it was all about rest, rest, rest. And I was like, well, really, it should be GraphQL. That's going to be the new, the new hotness. Um, I say new, like I said, six years old, but still. Um, if you put a GraphQL endpoint onto headless, I think you'd attract a lot more new audience to it, and a lot more front-enders would want to use it. Uh, headless, for those who don't know, the current plan, I believe, is you're not allowed to run any packages in it. You're not allowed to run any custom code in it. It's literally going to be vanilla and Braco with a REST endpoint. Um, and a few other bits of magic, like client, to help you work with it. So if that's the case, you can't build a web API endpoint on it. Can't do any custom stuff. You're literally stuck to what the REST API does. Whereas if you put GraphQL on it, it actually makes a lot of these problems go away. I'll see why in a minute. Uh, but what was cool is Neil said GraphQL would be lovely. Uh, and I took that to be, go on then, let's see what we can do. So uh, we started trying to see what we could get done uh, to see if we can get it into our bracket. Uh, so what's it got to do with Umbreco? Like I say, I raised it at, at CodeGarden, and the, the focus of CodeGarden last year was headless, and the, they did the round circles. Everyone been to CodeGarden? Everyone aware of CodeGarden? You should go to CodeGarden. It's actually very good. Um, but on the last day, they do a thing called Open Space, where you can talk about just about anything. They have 30 slots. Uh, you can go up and you can pitch a talk that you want to talk about. You get a room like this. You get to stand up here and you get to talk to people. It's not like lightning talks. It's about everyone chips in in a big circle. Uh, and you get to talk about what you want to join. And I raised uh, this at, um, at one of the slots. I said we should try and get GraphQL in there. About 60 people turned up for that one. And we had core devs turned up, which was brilliant. And um, some of the other HQ people were there, either to hear what on earth GraphQL was and why we should care about it, or how might we be able to get it into, into core. And some of the ideas that were raised there were really good. And we went away to try and get some of those done. Um, some were more successful than others, while we tried to work out how to do it. Uh, I think it's a great fit with the way Umbraco stores its data. Put GraphQL on top, it's very, very easy to do. Uh, perfect fit for headless, again, anyone who's building apps uh, or you know, um, standalone, you know, like React JS um, front ends and things, they're expecting GraphQL to be available now because it's, it's actually becoming quite popular. And so I think it would have brought more, more people to it. Expand the appeal of Umbraco as a result. 
And luckily, the community stepped up. We had a big, long conversation on the developer forum. We had some uh, issues created to try and see how we might be able to flesh this out. A couple of people tried to build a GraphQL endpoint of sorts. Um, and then one little person just, just sort of raised his head and said, I've got something. And that person was this lovely man, Rasmus, um, who looks really funky there with the, is it just shimmering just for me or everyone else? Uh, uh, Rasmus, um, he works in, in Denmark. Uh, he's now works at HQ. Uh, he, they offered a position there. And he had, you know, when you meet one of those developers who sort of, they, they just seem to be very good at just knocking stuff out and they're very modest about it. So like, well, there's this little thing that I wrote over here. You might want to have a look at that. And you had a look at it and it does everything. <laughs> it's just like, wow, not bad for something you've knocked up over several weekends. Um, and it fixed, I was prepared to put a lot of my team's development time into trying to get GraphQL working. He'd already done it. So we, 90% of the problems had been done. Um, so we took that and then we, we could work on the other problems like how do you do authentication or, you know, the biggest stuff that you tend to push to the, to do that later. So he'd done all the exciting bits, but I took them to be, he'd done all the boring bits to me because it was kind of like, I could actually use GraphQL straight away with the code he'd written. Whereas before I was scratching in my head thinking, well, we'd have to fix this problem and that problem. And he said he'd just fixed them already. So uh, big respect to Rasmus. So that, it's, it's pretty much all his work that I'm about to show you. I'm just the mouthpiece for his work. Uh, so, uh, right, that's roughly the context of how we've got to where we got. Going to explain a little bit more about what on earth GraphQL is now and how we might use that instead of using REST. So I'll compare and contrast the two. So uh, I'm going to give you a sample problem, which is from our uh, speciality. We do travel. That's our main, main um, websites that we do. And so here's a sample travel problem that we might have to do. Hopefully you'll all be able to, to get your head around. So we want to create a short list of hotels. So you want someone to be able to add and remove hotels to say that they particularly like those so that they can show them with their other partner or whatever and say, can you choose which hotel we want to do? And on that hotel, uh, we want to say a summary of each hotel with an image and a name, maybe star rating and such. Uh, and we want this list to be dynamic, so we'll be adding, removing and all the rest of it. Don't worry, we're not doing any JavaScript. We're just thinking about what data might you need to be able to power that. Uh, so it's all going to be client side. Probably going to look something like that. And because we're developers and we do this for a living, we can look at that and go, mm hmm, I can see exactly what we need. I have a rough idea of what shape of data we need. I can now think about how on earth we might get that. Happy with that? Good. So, so you might come back with a JSON object looking something like this. So we've got a hotel ID, we've got a name for it, star rating, whereabouts is it, what country is it in, and a URL for our image. Easy peasy. So, how on earth might we get that? Well, we've got a couple of different options. We could use REST. Um, and we have two options here. We can either create a custom endpoint, that's called a short list endpoint, where we can maybe pass in a list of IDs, or we could say, can I have all the short list hotels? Something like that. Uh, and that will return us just the data we need. So just that shape that we've got, it'll give us that, which is great. Or we could just go and fetch all the data for each hotel and throw away the bits we don't need. Let's say there's 20 fields that come back. We only need those five that we listed. We'll throw the rest away. We can get away with that. That will work as well. And possibly we might be able to use something that already exists to be able to do that. So let's dig, dig deep dive a little bit more. So option one, just the data that we need. Uh, this has some issues. So by creating an endpoint that's just returning those five fields, we might end up with a point which is called underfetching. There might be a change in the feature set and it says, well, actually now we need something else. Can we render the price out as well? And now we have an endpoint that's hard coded to just those five features, uh, fit fields, sorry. And now we have a choice of what do we do? Do we change that endpoint or do we spin up another one? Uh, we have an underfetching problem, so now we're going to fix it. Either way, we're going to need a backend developer to go in and change the endpoint. And we're going to need to release that endpoint in order to be able to, before the front ender can even go hit it. So we have a kind of chicken and egg kind of situation. Um, and we want to add yet more prices, uh, more fields after that. So we've added country name, and now they come back and say, can you add the price in as well? So now we've got to go through the cycle twice, and we're changing that endpoint. Starts getting a little bit messy, especially when the endpoint's used elsewhere, because you didn't know about it. Someone else needed to use something very similar to shortlist, and they decided that it was already an endpoint called shortlist, and they said, oh, that's kind of the same fields I need. I'm going to use that endpoint too. And you know about this when you release it to live, and it blows up. Uh, because they've used an undocumented endpoint that they shouldn't have done. So do you touch it, do you not? Uh, do you want to modify the existing endpoint? Again, that will cause you grief if you do, especially if a third party is using that endpoint. 
So again, in travel, we have a lot of APIs where other people pull our data out to power other their sites. So if you've got like a, what we'll call affiliate sites, they'll list your amazing holiday. And for that, they want to know what hotel you're staying in. So we're sharing all that content. But yet, if we change our API, we'll blow up several sites by doing so. So we have to be careful uh, how we do that. So we get around that, we create a new endpoint, because that's safe, right? Because that is, the, we don't know who's using it, so we'll just create shortlist two or something, and everything's fine. And this leads to all sorts of horrific problems, and at this point, lots of nodding will occur. So we have get hotels new, that'll get us out of something, but then you change it again, you have new, new, which way do you go there? Get hotels two, that seems sensible. No, not really, is it? Get hotels 27 comes around at some point. So then someone says, ah, let's be a bit more clever about this. Get hotels with price. It's self-describing. It's fantastic. Get hotels with price and star rating. Get hotels with price rating and big image, and on it goes. And before you know it, you have thousands of these things, and no one knows what they do, because you don't document them. No one knows where they're used. No one dare touch them. It's, uh, do you have the game Buckaroo? Uh, we have the you have a donkey, and you've got to put loads of bits on it. <laughs> and when you put the last bit on it, it sort of pings off with a big spring and sends everything flying. And you can get a bit like that. No one wants to touch <laughs> those API endpoints. And over time, give a site, I mean, we work in travel, a lot of our sites, they last five years. Five years of this, uh, you can imagine. Uh, compiling times and everything, and no one ever goes back and cleans it up, there's never time. So you get yourself in a lot of pain doing that. So then we go to the other option and say, that's just got pain written all over it. Let's be easy. Let's just go get all the hotel data throw away what we don't need, everything's golden. This has got issues too. So this is what we call a massive overfetch. You're, you're pulling down 50 fields. You only need five of them. Some of those fields are gonna be huge. Like the hotel description for a hotel, guess what? It's like a huge chunk of text. And you're bringing that down because you need this much text <laughs> for five fields. It's an awful lot of bandwidth that you're throwing away for not much reason throwing it all away. Uh, you've got other problems. All that JSON that you're now putting down the wire to the client, you're burning their CPU, their memory, your bandwidth. And if you travel to another country and your phone says you only have 3G, which used to be wonderful, but when you used to 4G, uh, boy, do you really notice it. I hate fonts, for instance, on websites when you've got 3G and a website's pulling down 400Ks worth of fonts. Like, Go away, I want to know about Brexit. Uh, and instead, you've got to wait till it, it pulls down. I don't want to know about Brexit. Um, so you've got all these things that you're now burning. Um, other things is that response for that hotel could grow over time. So at the time you first generate this code, you've probably got dummy data in there. You've got 10 hotels. You're testing out this feature. Everything's good. And then they put real data in there. And suddenly, everything that you thought seemed all right and snappy gets quite lazy. There's loads of data comes down. And again, over five years, loads of crazy fields get added to your hotel. And they all go down the wire. And you've ended up, well, with a problem that's hidden, really. Only you will really know about it, um, or your client will know about it, or your end user will know about it, but no one will really know why the site's got a bit sluggish. Uh, but it's all because you couldn't be bothered, and you went this route instead. So they're the two problems that we have. They've both got their issues. Uh, changes are needed at both ends. You need a developer involved to set both those endpoints up. <coughs> um, they can also either be too narrow, you're only getting just enough fields, or they're too wide, you're bringing all the fields both of which can be a little bit wasteful. And there's no Goldilocks solution of some sort of magical way that you could get just the information you needed in a safe way uh, that you could change over time without necessarily impacting anyone. And so I like to think that REST is a bit like a mixtape. When you have a mixtape, for those that remember them, um, there's always two, two tracks on a mixtape that you really like, and they're always on different sides. And you have to like forward fast and rewind to try and get to the two that you like. And then the rest of the time, there's loads of tracks on there that you don't really like. And sometimes when you're in busy traffic, you just let them run and you listen to them. It's a bit wasteful until you come around to the track you like. They kind of do the job, but they're not great. And you can end up with a lot of them. Again, this is reception-tastic. So somewhere on there is your favorite track. <laughs> it takes a while to get there. Now, if we switch it over and think about GraphQL, how on earth does this change this sort of stuff? So GraphQL turns the problem on the head. Rather than you writing an endpoint that will return some data to the front end, which is what it wants, Instead, the front end sends a query to the back end. The back end knows how to stitch that query together, and then it will return just the data you need. In a nutshell, that's kind of kind of what GraphQL does. So it sort of parses your query. So the client's telling exactly what it wants. 
GraphQL will then stitch together that thing and send it back, rather than us knowing what you want ahead of time and, and, and putting it together. Client side asks for it once, server knows how to stitch all that all together, and it returns just what is needed. So there's no underfetching, there's no overfetching. If you want to add a new field, add in country, add in price, you add that to the query, server knows how to stitch that together, just returns it. And you can have multiple queries here, there, and everywhere. You can have shared queries if you want. It doesn't matter, because the server knows how to return just that data. So I like to think that GraphQL is more like Alexa. You can ask it to play exactly what you want, and it will do exactly that. Alexa, play Thunderclouds by Sia on Spotify. Playing Thunderclouds by Sia on Spotify. And it does its magic, and lo and behold, the song starts. You start dancing. It's funny, because when I wrote that, that was a song that was in my head about a year ago. Uh, and I'm still doing it. I haven't listened to that song for months. But it's funny how these things can come back and remind you. Uh, so quit teasing. What does GraphQL look like? Oh, it looks like that. Isn't that exciting? God, I love working in IT. So <laughs> I'll strip it down a bit. Yes, have a moment. Cruise. It looks like JSON, doesn't it? But it's not JSON, is it? It's kind of broken. There's bits missing. Uh, so we have... Uh, you can ask for various objects and queries. This is the topmost. This is our query that we're asking for. I'm telling it specifically I would like a type, and that type is a hotel, and that type is expecting an ID. So I'd like, how can I have a hotel ID 12345? And then I'm saying, and this is, this is the bits that are of that type that I want back. I want name and I want star rating. Whoops. Uh, image URL and URL, please. And GraphQL can understand that, know what you want, and then it will return you this. So again, we get proper JSON back this time. So. JSON-like on the way up, proper JSON on the way back. Uh, everything always gets wrapped in a data element, uh, and that's because there can be additional bits and bobs that we can add in at the bottom as well. For instance, errors come back, which is quite handy. So you haven't got to guess what went wrong. Uh, instead, it actually tells you, uh, which, is, which is really good. Um, and then the shape that we asked for, well, here it is. There's your name, there's your star rating, there's your image, there's your URL. That's exactly what I requested, and that's exactly what it's come back with, which is lovely. And it can do this because GraphQL knows your data. And to do that, it needs to know what shape your data is on the server. And this is where some server magic is required. Now, at this point, you might be thinking, hang on a minute, you said that one of the problems with REST is we needed a server-side developer. And now you're telling us that we need to set up server stuff. So does that not need a server-side developer? And yes, you would if you were doing like a vanilla GraphQL stuff with just database tables. You'd have to magically string that together one way or another. But because I'm, the way Umbraco stores its data, what is it? It's doc types, properties. We've got relations of doc types. We can kind of walk all that data and build you the schema automatically. And that's kind of what we've managed to do. So you can get all this for free without really worrying about it. So like I say, we know what data types we have. We know what fields we have. And we know how they relate. And as a result, we can make this magical thing called a schema. So. Uh, Facebook, while doing all this magic, they realized, wouldn't it be nice if there was some sort of front end that you could go in and just start messing with this endpoint and it would start helping you and giving you stuff. And because it knows your schema, it can effectively do IntelliSense and things like that. Because it's possible to say, you're asking for a hotel, you want some fields. Well, I know what fields are available on a hotel. They're all these fields. Which ones would you like? Wouldn't that be sweet? And so one of their developers sat down and wrote a single page app called Graphical. Uh, which anyone can have, it's free, you drop it on, you point it at an endpoint, and it goes, oh, I'm pointing at the endpoint, I know what the schema looks like, because I know how to get the schema from the endpoint. <laughs> Here's everything you can do on this endpoint. Go, oh, no guesswork, no shortlist underscore three new. I kind of, I can, it actually tells me what's available. It's like, what fields are on there? I don't know. Oh, you go in here and it says, these are exactly what fields are. Because uh, it knows your schema, and it can give you intelligence, and it has error checking which is part of that developer experience I was telling you about. Rather than, uh, Umbraco's getting better at this, but you've probably done that thing where you try and get something out of Umbraco and it just blows up. We're like, error at line 11. And you're going, what is the error? You know, a qu query un unrecognized. What is the query? What, I, what, what is the string I'm passing in that you can't read? Don't tell me it's blown up. Tell me why it's blown up. And that's part of the developer experience stuff that they do. So here, for instance, if you ask for a field that doesn't exist, rather than <laughs> it will return you all the fields it knows. And then there's an error bit at the bottom. And it goes, by the way, I couldn't find price with that. That doesn't exist. Uh, and so you go, oh, brilliant. And the front end developer can see that in the console and go, oh, yeah, I've mistyped that. 
or that doesn't exist. And so that, that sort of feedback is really, really important. And you can do it with instant live data. So when you're using GraphQL and you're doing, or graphical, when you start typing away, this magical thing happens when you give it to a front ender. Because they start typing away, and the data's coming up, and then they run the query. Let's say that shortlist query is really quite easy to write that. They run that query, and then live data from the, that they used to just appears, bam, instant. It's really quite exciting when you get away to it. Uh, and it's really easy to share queries. You, in graphical, you can say, cut and paste that URL, because it actually puts the query on the URL, and then you can sling that in Slack and say, that will do it for you, or have a go on that, or um, this isn't giving me back the data I want, what am I doing wrong? And then you can send that to the developer and then go, oh, you're doing it like this, and then they can send you the URL back. It's lovely. Make, makes deep debugging really, really fast. So let's see it in action. This is a video that, oh, wow. Oh, oh dear. Hmm. Can we do anything with that? Hmm, maybe. Right, anyway, we'll bluff it. Ignore all that, that's comments. This is the magic. <laughs> I'm so sorry. IT. Uh, so I'm writing a query here. This is graphical. You can see I'm adding in IntelliSense stuff while I'm adding in some various bits. This is from the standard data set that they have for GraphQL, which is Star Wars characters. I think it's a dreadful idea. Your nerd in you initially is going, oh, that's quite clever. Oh, the droids and aliens and planets and spaceships, that's really fun. I don't know Star Wars that well, and I bet you don't either. Um, so you can type in some of this stuff, it's weird. But what you can see, I'm writing the query in, bang, straight away, that's the live data from the data source coming in. And it's the shape that I asked for. So I've asked for species, I've asked for, uh, for a particular species, give me the name, give me the uh, lifespan, and give me the eye color. So over here we've got name is droid, then we've got average lifespan is null, because droids live forever, right? Uh, eye color, so they don't have any, that's fine as well. And down here we've got Wookiee, and they out, on average live 400 years, did you know? Is that Earth years though, or Star Wars years? I don't know. Um, and then, did you know Wookiees can have blue eyes? I didn't either. But I've asked that, that shape, and this is where it's come back to. And it knows that that's an array, and it does all this magic stuff. Uh, just from, from that little query, I get all that data back. And I can loop over all that stuff now, obviously, and render that out any which way I like, because it's just JSON. And, and uh, again, I'm not, build, I'm not gonna build you an Angular app, a React.js app, or dare I say, a Vue.js app, that will talk to this stuff. I assume everyone's smart enough to know that JSON could be pretty fied by whatever front end you want. This is about how you get that data, not how you make it. Um, there's two more videos. They're gonna be painful, I'm sorry. I didn't know. We'll see what we can do. So, developer experience, helping the developer do their job with suggestive and proactive help and warning. So that graphical stuff, got IntelliSense, it's telling you what you're doing, telling you what's available, it's all quite nice. And when you say, I want a hotel, for instance, it will say, oh, you need to pass me an ID. If you don't give me an ID, I won't work. So it's, it's helping you get your job done. You need more of it in, uh, in Abraco, I think. Um, more developer goodness, it's got safe defaults. Everything can be null. And because you know everything's in null, as opposed to an empty string or a, a, a zero or whatever, you can check for that sort of stuff. So if you ask for a field that doesn't exist, it will still return you that field in the shape, but it will just set it to null. And that means your front end stuff doesn't blow up if, uh, if someone's changed something. Uh, errors can be returned as a property, which I told you about. And I'll show you that again in a minute. And we get this IntelliSense, and there's safety built in. Uh, your developer brain is probably also going, so you want me to give this to the front enders. They can query anything. How on earth is that performant? Surely they're going to do some crazy, crazy, crazy query that's going to bring the server down. Well, there's actually something built in called a complexity score. Uh, and so when you build your query and you send that to GraphQL, it'll look at it and go, hmm, this one's going to be messy. It, it's got a complexity of store above 10, 12, whatever you set it to. And it goes, I'm going to throw that out. I'm not going to run it. So it will send an error back in the standard format that will say, I'm not going to run that. It's too, too intensive. Go, go, ask a, go ask someone who knows what they're doing uh, to, to be able to get you the data you want to. So it, it looks after you and stops you getting into trouble. This is what the error stuff looks like. Uh, we've got error, error options. That was our data that would normally come back. And down the bottom, there's a nice thing. Notice if it's blown up because it can't find anything, still comes back with nulls. So my front end developer is not doing any null checking or anything, just goes, I want an object, I'm expecting name to be on there. It is still on there, it's just not set to anything. Uh, so nothing blows up. And then the error is coming back, it says cannot find doc type hotel because I've misspelt it. Um, uh, and it tells us exactly where it is. So again, rather than just blowing up on line 11, tells me exactly why it's blown up on line 11. And a simple typo. Uh, I can correct that and get, 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 me, uh, get me back. So developer benefits. 
Front-enders can get the data they need. They don't necessarily need uh, a back-end developer to do it. Streamlines development. Uh, normally, when you're asking for something, let's talk about you know, adding price. Sounds like such an easy feature. And from the customer's perspective, it's like, well, it's just a field. How hard can it be? Uh, yet, when we actually do the full cycle, uh, the designer needs to come in, squeeze it in somewhere. Front-ender then needs to change the template for that. That's fine. Can't go live until they've got the data. Then you have to pass it on to the server guy. Server guy is busy doing something. Uh, you've got to wait four or five days till that done. Then you've got to wait for a release. <sighs> then that's got to go up. And then eventually it gets ready. And then the client goes, why have you charged me four days for <laughs> adding price to a shortlist? This is ridiculous. And why is it taking three weeks? And that's why. And suddenly by doing this, you stop at the front ender. The front ender needs price. GraphQL, give me price. There's price. Put price in there. Bang, done. Uh, drastically reduces that turnaround time. So one endpoint, you can have multiple sources. So if you've got GraphQL from Braco, once it's in up there, let's say you've got some custom fields and everything else, custom tables. Let's say you've got to call out to another third party API somewhere. You can put all these in under this one endpoint if you want to. And then suddenly there's one clear way in to get this data. And you can go get, you can mask multiple microservices if you want to under this one endpoint. Um, and make it seamless. So again, the front ender doesn't have to know, oh, if you want to go get the special offers da data, then there's this other thing over here you've got to call. Uh, instead, they can, you can tie it all together and it just makes things a lot easier. Uh, another nice one is it warns you about obsolete files. So if you, uh, obsolete fields, sorry. So things change. Five years, we're going to retire the odd field every now and then. Um, and what this will do is it'll say, the, this field that you're using in the query shouldn't be used anymore. It's not, it's not used anymore. And that will come back in the errors as well. So it's actually giving you a ha helping hand that, you, that you're doing that wrong. And the way we do that in uh, GraphQL from Braco is um, we have a legacy tab. So on your doc type, you can create a legacy tab, and you can move fields over there out the way. And then our stuff then is smart enough to go, oh, it's on that tab. That means it's, it's obsolete, so I'm going to send you a message. So if you, if you access anything in there, it will say, shouldn't be using this anymore. And then we cheat, and we actually use the description for that field. We actually use that as instructions as to what you ought to use. So if you want to, you can move a field over to the legacy tab. Right in there, from now on, you should be using this other thing. As a, for instance, let's say we had um, related hotel. So this other hotel is related to this. So if you like this hotel, you might also like this other hotel. And we have a, a picker of some description to be able to do that. And then at some time in the future, we decide, actually, we want more than one related hotel. We want multiple. So now we create a field called multiple hotels. So it's related hotels, plural. And we, you can use both. You could go to the, just the single, or you could go to the, the better one. Uh, and so we will move the old one over to the legacy tab, and the, other, the new field will still be there. Um, and everything still works, except one returns an array and one doesn't. So stuff could still blow up. <laughs> so uh, some other bits that your brain's probably thinking about. Haven't we just written SQL for the client end, front client end to mess around with the server end? And no, we haven't, because you can't really do anything, any damage with it. It's literally just the bare bones of a query language for now. Um, so you're just getting JSON and you're prettifying it. And that idea of prettifying JSON, I really liked. It was sort of, once I heard that, I thought that really sums up 90% of what I do for a living, is I have a JSON object and I'm making it look nice on a web page. Um, and as long as that's your outcome of what you want to do, GraphQL is the, the magic bit that you're probably missing. Uh, it's difficult to build a bad query, as discussed. It won't let you do anything that's massively in, um, in performance. And stop when you're feeling resistance. If you really are trying to do crazy stuff, maybe you need a REST endpoint that's very specialist for your needs. But uh, on the whole, this lets us do all the front end stuff we want to do uh, pretty easily. And it's damn fast without a little effort. Again, part of your developer brain is going, this must be slow. There's no way this could be fast. Uh, but it actually is really, really quick. Uh, so beyond the basics, yes, we're pretty fine, JSON. But there's other bits you can do. You can do pagination. Let's say our shortlist hotels could have 50 hotels in it. Uh, you can actually very easily say, I'd like the first five, please. And then it will return you another chunk of code, uh, chunk of data, which is like, right, you're on a page size of five. There are another six pages to do. You're currently on this one. And if you want to go to the next one, you need to pass this in. Uh, and it's, that's all just baked in for you. So we no longer have off by one errors when we're trying to work out what page we're on and all the rest of it. It's all baked in, and you can just use it. We've got filtering. Find me all hotels with a star rating greater than four. OK. And that's in, built into the box. We've got fragments, which I'll show you in a minute. Um, 
You can imagine if you're starting to get the same sort of chunk of data coming back all the time, you don't really want that everywhere. We like drying our code up somewhere. So you can have a special file that's just a chunk of fragments. For instance, this is a shortlist hotel fragment. This is an SEO metadata fragment and so on. And you can keep referring back to those. It's like an include, basically, into your query. Uh, they're really funky too. Mutations, which is I'd like you to add this customer review back into our data source, please. So it's like a write. Uh, we don't support those currently because they're quite hard. Uh, but the plan is eventually uh, we will do. But for now, think of it as read only, um, which is one of the things you can do. There's loads more you can do with it. Uh, like I say, Laura's talk, if you get a chance to see it, I think she might be doing it at Code Garden. I hope so. Um, and um, that, that should be video to be able to see that as well. She goes into much greater detail about some of the cool stuff you can do. There's even bits I didn't even know we'd written yet uh, <laughs> that it supports, so it's pretty good for that. So how does it work? And Bracken knows your data. We loop over those dot types on startup, and then we build your magic schema. Uh, this, is, this is the code that we sort of managed to write. And as a result, you then have an endpoint, and it just works, because it knows about all your doc types, knows what fields are available. So graphically, and you, we have graphical built in, that's the UI. So if you install the package that we've written uh, for this, uh, you have a URL you can go hit, and straight away you've got that UI into your back office data, and it just works. There's no setting anything up, it just sort of goes, ta-da! Big caveat with it, though. All your data is now available via GraphQL. So if you've got anything in there you don't want to be public, tough. Uh, there is some authentication that we've built in, so you can whitelist and blacklist. Uh, but by default, be careful. Um, run it on staging first. Oh, I'm sorry. Let's see what this does. Uh, right, so I want to go get a hotel. God, this is going to be awful to read like this. We should have taken some LSD or mushrooms or something. It's probably, <laughs> probably a lot better. Uh, so here we go. So I'm going to get some content. I'm going to get it by type. Uh, hotel pages is one of my doc types, hotel page. I'm going to get this ID, please. Uh, and I'm going to do a, a number of different queries here and build up on them. So you'll see me do some weird stuff and then come back and polish it a little bit. I'd like to go get the canonical link. It's one of those words you don't say out loud very often. Conical, canical. Anyway, the ultimate link, please. Um, and you notice that came back empty. Ooh, that's not right. I'm trying to get the, the link to this page. How can I get it? Well, I'm going back to this thing, and this is, uh, a, this is built in on Braco content, which I'm about to write. So obviously, name, URL, uh, and such, their fields are special within Umbraco anyway. Every content item has those. But it's possible you might already have a name field yourself, and that those two names would clash. So we've had to uh, put those under something called content data. And again, Graphical is helping me out. I'm pressing the Prettify button, and it's made all this nice, which is good. And then I run that straight away, and I get the results back straight away. Um, and you can see the speed of which I'm typing this and the speed of which it's coming back. The, the, the development cycle of this is very, very pleasing when you start using it. Uh, that's the end of that one. Uh, so issues when we try and do this with Umbraco. Uh, which field of public? Like I said, currently everything is. Uh, in one of our sites, for instance, we have a um, uh, the price that we actually buy the stock in, uh, and then we have the price that we sell the stock in. I don't want the price that I buy the stock in to ever be public, because people get grumpy, or they know how much discount to ask for. Uh, so we want to keep that, that private, for instance. Uh, we have some quirky data types in Umbraco too. Vorto, for instance, is wonderful, but how on earth do you return Vorto data you know, via something like this? It's kind of awkward. We've got some ideas for some of the quirky ones. Uh, we can't do all of them as yet because we need some community help, which is partly why I'm here. Uh, so feel free to, to have a play and a dip in. Uh, but on the whole, we've got quite a lot of the, the built-in ones just work. So it's just some of the quirky ones that need a bit more thinking that we've left to be. Uh, compositions, uh, it sort of works. You can ask for a, an SEO composition to come back, and it will give you just the fields for that. You can, I can get that hotel data one that I had, for instance. Like, so give me that hotel data, and then can I have it as, a, as an SEO composition? It will just give me those fields for the, for the SEO composition. Um, we have name clashes with built-in properties, which is why we had content data. Um, uh, that got, allowed us to get around that. One of the things I have learned by using this, which we've now changed, for instance, writing content data for all the fields gets a bit wordy, makes your queries look, look quite awkward. So we've now changed that. We just put an underscore for all the internal uh, and bracket fields which makes things a lot easier. So it's made our queries a lot, um, a lot easier. Computed fields. Let's say you want to know, well, what's the total number of reviews that we have for this hotel? Um, we don't really know how to do that yet. Um, 
So if anyone got any ideas, you're more than welcome to chip in. I'm sure there's a pull request. Um, and if you have your own custom models, you're kind of on your own if you want to do that. It's what we call the MacGyver way of working. You have to sort of stitch it together yourself because uh, we've been too busy doing the bit we've been doing rather than documenting all that stuff. But if you poke through the code, you'll, have a, you'll get a rough idea of how to, you might be able to do it. And again, Laura uh, has managed to do it quite easily. Um, I was really impressed when she showed me all the different bits she's put in. So it's totally doable and there's someone out there doing it in live production. Oh, here's a good one. What if I change a field or a doc type? Uh, kind of talked a little bit about this uh, with the legacy thing. Handling changes. Who's using that field? Uh, this comes from fa Facebook. When they do their APIs, obviously they've got a million and one things talking to all the different bits. If they want to change a field or retire a field, how are they meant to know? You can't break Facebook, can you? How are you meant to know that you can get rid of a field? Uh, and so one of the ways they did it is they put a uh, an extra layer in front of all their API calls that would just count every time an API calls hit. Uh, and when that number got down to zero after a month, they knew it was safe, you could get rid of it. But until then, they just wouldn't get rid of anything, um, which is the other way of doing it. Delete nothing. So if you, if you put a field in and you mistyped it, but it's gone out into the wild, it's out in the wild. You, can't, you, never, you can never delete it because you don't know who's using it. So you move it to the legacy tab and be done with it. And again, if you're smart, you can hide the legacy tab from editors. They don't ask any awkward questions. Uh, and everything just keeps running. Uh, so we have legacy or an obsolete tab. Uh, either or works. And then the me metric middleware, um, which we've tried to put in, uh, but it doesn't work. <laughs> this idea that you can count how many people are using different queries. Uh, time for another one. What am I doing now? I can't remember. OK, I want to get multiple hotels. Uh, and again, doing this dog fooding stuff teaches us that actually we need GraphQL to be able to allow you to pass in multiple IDs, uh, which is one of the mods that we've got um, doing it this sort of way. So this is going to get pretty wordy on purpose, because then I'm going to tidy it up and shorten it down. So don't go, this is shit. Instead, just go, OK, I can kind of see what he's doing. Trust in Pete. He's going to get to a point that's a bit tidier. Uh, so I'm making two hotels here, and I'm giving them different names so I can reference them. You can see they're coming back in the JSON data uh, in exactly the same shape I want. There's quite a lot of duplication, though, and we're going to try and tidy that up uh, now by uh, trying to use a fragment. Um, but before we do that, I'll show you how I'm going to add yet more stuff and, again, really lay it on thick that uh, this duplication stuff's a bit horrible. So banner here is, uh, we've got a picker that will let you go pick a banner. Um, I think that's actually media. And that in itself has a URL and so that's showing you how, even though you've got a, a content item which itself picks another content item, GraphQL knows about that relation, can follow it down the tree, and allows you to pick whatever you want to get to. And banner there's coming back with null for one of them. And I cut and paste that down. Look how long this is getting. <gasps> wordy, wordy queries. So I'm going to tidy it up. I'm going to make something called a fragment of a usable chunk of query that we can sort of include. Where's, where's me F and me R? <laughs> anyway, it does say fragment, I promise. So cut and paste all that in. Now I can go get rid of this bit here, where, where I've cut and pasted that from. I'll go back up and I'll say, can you use this fragment, please, instead? And again, it's JSON-like. It's not actually JSON. So when you start seeing some quirky format in, you're going, what's that about? That's not valid. It's because it's not actually JSON. We actually met the guys who wrote GraphQL when we went to the React conference in Paris a couple of years ago. And one of the queries was, why didn't you just do it in JSON? Because everyone gets that. And he said, well, we tried that initially on the first iteration. It was just so wordy. You were doing, get me name, colon, empty string. And he said, it just looked horrible. So we went the extra mile to strip all that nonsense out. And then it, once we were doing that, it meant we could do stuff like this spread operator here. And that allows us to say, could you just include, which is basically what that short list does, uh, this fragment. And it allowed it to just work. So it kind of makes sense. So again here, I'm adding all this nonsense down here to make this a very big fragment. And I've tidied up both of those. And now you can see how I'm now using a fragment. That query now is much shorter. And if I ever want to change any of this that I want all the shortlist to have, I've got one place. We've dried it all up. And that's all baked in, and you get that all for free 
uh, just by installing the package. So other problems going through your brain, is it fast? Yes, it is. Uh, it uses iPublish content under the hood. It's as fast as iPublish content, which is 10 milliseconds, and it will come back with a piece of content. So depending on how many pieces of content you're asking for, it's bang, 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 very quick, like the speed I speak. Um, we have debug metrics in every query. So if you like want to ask how long did it take or how many SQL queries did you do, you can switch that on, and it will dump out uh, a load of debug information for you. Uh, it's all configurable, and we have ideas on how we can add more stuff. Ooh, that's awful. Sorry. Uh, that's uh, what a debug looks like when you switch it on. So your data is right at the top, and then this is all crazy amounts of nonsense. It's basically if you put mini profiler on, if you switch that, we've just basically grabbed the mini profiler information and put it in as JSON, so it can tell you exactly how long everything took. Because our developer hearts and brains say there's no way this can be fast. It must be the most inefficient way of querying data ever, because it's a whole other layer. It's doing query passing. There's no way. It's never going on my site, right? Well, you can switch this on and go, <laughs> that's fast. No problem at all. Crack on. Uh, got bigger fish to fry. So that, that lets you get that, that out that way. Uh, authentication, we have it baked in. So for instance, you would have a build server will be allowed to access different fields or uh, an external trusted partner with a key might be able to access your private stock prices and things. Uh, we've got the database stuff for that set up, but we ran out of time to actually get it up and running as well we can. There's a pull request uh, waiting for someone if they want to take that on. Uh, we'd love to see that sort of stuff in. Uh, we do have that you can set permissions uh, per account. Uh, but we only have one default account at the minute, and that's the one that you can you can set the, the permissions on. Um, and by default, obviously, it's called default for a reason. When you install, that's the one that's on, and you have to go in and you have to say which fields you want to be available and publicly available. The more we thought about it, one of the reasons we haven't done the full authentication is 95% of it, all the use cases we have come up with, you, you know which fields you, you're happy to have on the site. They're going to be public anyway. There's no problem with it. There's probably only a handful that you want to hide. So we don't actually think you need an account. Again, your developer brain goes, oh, we must have different accounts that have access to different things. But if you think about the use cases for it, that's very, 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 very small that you need that sort of functionality. So we've moved our attention to, to something else instead. Um, and yes, you have to opt in by design, uh, which is wrong to how I said it earlier. So by design, it won't give you any fields. When you first install it, you have to go in and hit a bunch of checkboxes. Um, so sorry. Um, so you have to go in per doc type and say, I want this to be public, this is public, this is public, this isn't public, this isn't public. Uh, and that is built in to allow you to manage what you're trying to do. It's not beautiful, this UI, but it's functional. Don't judge. <laughs> oh, there we go. So if you want to play with it now, you certainly can. Just search for Embraco GraphQL, you will find the GitHub repo that's got it on. Uh, it's also a NuGet package, you can install it in three minutes. And then you spin up your site and GraphQL is working. It's actually rather pleasing when you get it up and running. Um, when we, we, I think it was about November time, uh, was the last time that the NuGet was released, I think, uh, which seems like an age away now. Uh, but then Rasmus got hired by HQ, and we were told that he was going to get hired to work on GraphQL, which would have been amazing, because then it would have gotten core and everything would have been fantastic. But instead, they've got him on headless, uh, so he's not working on what he is. And uh, so his, but his, job, his desire is to get back onto it anyway, whether in his own free time or part of the, headle uh, the headless work for HQ. Uh, and we've been chipping away at it as well, doing um, off-road code's been adding a few hours and stuff on there as well. We've got it running on two of our client sites. Only one of those clients actually knows. Uh, so we've actually got it in production and we're, we're whenever we a new feature comes up, we're like, oh, could use GraphQL for that. So we're slowly moving that way with our development. Um, but trying to sell the value of it to, to clients is difficult um, when they don't understand it. Uh, but when you say we can really shorten production time, uh, that's all they need to hear. And they're like, oh, brilliant. Then yes, spend a bit of time installing it uh, and getting this magic, what a thing that only you understand doing what it's doing. So uh, it's good to get in. And these are all the lovely people who've been working on it, looking really weird, thanks to this projector. Um, so there's Rasmus, who's now at HQ. We've got Jack, Janae, Kyle, uh, Steve, who all work with me, uh, and are wonderful people, and some dickhead in a space helmet uh, at the end there. Um, that would be me. Uh, future plans, 
want to get it into core. It's already on live sites. We want to do more work on accounts. Uh, we want to allow for mutations so you can push stuff back up via it, which is uh, part of the specification, but we don't currently support it. We want to get it working with V8, which is a question everyone's going to ask us. Uh, they've changed loads of stuff, but there still isn't a document that says, you used to do it this way, and now we do it this way, which is something you think would be key uh, before you release the new version. Um, so as a result, we're still scratching our heads as to how we might be able to get it to do what it needs to do. But you can install it on V7 right now, and it will just run out the box. Uh, V8 will be coming uh, at some point. That's one of the reasons I want to get it in core, because then they have to support it and not break things. Um, we also, the docs are a bit uh, cryptic uh, about how to do some of the stuff, because it assumes you totally get GraphQL and it just dives, deep dives straight into it. And so we're working on trying to make some more touchy-feely, ease you in gently docs, uh, which will get you up and running. But on the whole, any GraphQL docs that you can find or read will work, because it uses the GraphQL uh, schema. So. Uh, anything you can find will do. And there's loads of other goodies that are coming out. There's things like Relay and other um, amazing client-side uh, stuff that will do things like um, scan your entire code base to find all the queries you've got, pull them out and put them in one JavaScript file. Uh, or they'll remove any duplicates or they'll smash up your queries into multiple fragments for you automatically uh, as part of build processes and stuff like that. Really exciting, clever stuff uh, going on. Um, and that's the kind of stuff that we want to start playing with. But we'll see. That's kind of it. So none of you interrupted me. None of you told me to slow down. Was that all good? Two of you fell asleep. That's OK. Are there any questions? All right. You're all lying, because at some point, someone's going to come and ask me one. Yes? Uh, which of the versions is uh, supported? Uh, I think it will run on anything above 7.6, I think. Uh, uh, let us know. We, we can't try it on all of them. Uh, but yeah, after they made whatever change it was um, that we rely on for iPublish content, I can't remember which one it was, um, then, so if you're mostly up to date, you, you'll be happy with it, it'll be fine. And like I say, to get it on eight is not the end of the world, but it does mean just sitting down and actually doing it. And we're all busy, right? Uh, but that said, the GitHub repo is there. We've got about 25 issues open. That doesn't mean they're necessarily issues. Some of them are like, how are we going to handle this? You know, the discussion points. We'd love some input. Um, and what I love when I do this talk is no one then actually does any of that. But I still keep asking. If you want to go in and have a look, we've got issues flagged up as, you know, uh, needs need some thought, needs some discussion, up for grabs. There's a couple of really easy ones that you can dive in if you want to have a play with it. Uh, if you get a chance, have a poke around. I know everyone's playing with V8, but some of these packages are kind of important in the future of what we're doing. And to do that, we kind of need to have more brains on it. Because I've got kids and hobbies as well. We've all got kids and hobbies as well. Why should you just let one person or one couple of people lean back and do all the work? So once in a while, spend an evening not in front of the TV and have a poke around and see what we can do. Uh, or convince your boss that you need to spend a Freedom Friday poking around with GraphQL or something. It's good fun to do this sort of stuff. Right, well, that's it, really. This is rare. I'm normally put on at the end of the day or after lunch. But I've been done first one. So I'm free all day now. <laughs> Where's the beer? <laughs>